Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is War's Bargaining Range, and again, this appears in Chapter 2 of my new book, The Rationality of War. You can find a PDF for free of that chapter by clicking on the video description, as well as the links to take you to Amazon and Barnes & Noble to purchase the full thing. Now remember, we are still caught up on this big question, can war be mutually beneficial? In the last video, we developed an algebraic model that basically told us that no, war cannot be mutually beneficial. The problem the problem with that model, though, is that there's absolutely no intuition about what's going on there. It's just a bunch of variables, and after completing the proof, while maybe you have some sort of mathematical understanding about why war can't be mutually beneficial, there's nothing really that sticks into your head. And so what we'll be doing in this video is developing that algebraic model and interpreting it geometrically by essentially going through the proof again and replacing all of those variables with an actual visual geometric interpretation of what's going on. And this will allow this idea of war not being mutually beneficial to really stick into your head, and I think this is really important and really cool. So let's get to it. Now remember the model from last time had two states, A and B. We're going to look at it as though these two states are bargaining over a strip of territory that looks like this. So on the left end we have A's capital, on the right end we have B's capital. A wants to draw the border as close to B's capital as possible, right, because that gives more land to A. And B wants the opposite. B wants to draw the border as close to A's capital as possible because that gives B more of the territory. And the next part of the model is that the bargaining object was worth one. So we can draw that as though this is a number line now. So on the left end of the number line, we have zero as the value. And on the right end of the number line, we have one as the value. And so A's capital is appearing on zero and B's capital is appearing on one. Now remember that A or PA is the probability that A wins a war. And because we don't have any draws in this model, one minus PA is the probability B wins the war. Now remember, because PA is a probability, PA must be between 0 and 1, so we can plot it on that number line that we just drew. So we can just put P of A right there. Now of course P of A could actually be anywhere on this number line. It's a general statement here. We're just putting it right here because to draw it we have to put it somewhere. But we could move this PA anywhere on this number line because PA could, in theory, be any number between 0 and 1. Now, if the states were to fight a war, the expected territory would look like this. On average, A would receive this much territory, everything between 0 and P of A. And B would receive 1 minus P of A, which is this amount of territory right here. Now keep in mind when the states actually do fight a war, that A will receive either all of it or nothing of it, and B will receive either all of it or nothing of it. But when you average out those outcomes times the probability of war, that's the expected share for A, and that's the expected share for B. Now in the model, we have that if the states fight a war, they pay costs. And both of those costs are going to be positive. A's costs are positive and B's costs are positive. So let's draw this out for state A. So remember that this is A's expected share of the territory, but A pays costs of war, which are this size right here. This is the size CA, if we drew that as a number right there. So if you take PA minus CA, you get to this point right here. That represents A's cost of war. And so if you deduct this cost from A's expected share of the territory, then A's actual expected war payoff is smaller than the uh, expected share of the territory because you have to factor in the cost. And so that brings down A's expected war payoff to just that amount right there. And in turn, that means that settlements A prefers to war is this range right here. So anything to the right of PA minus CA gives A more value out of that settlement than they would get from war, because A gets this amount from war, and so if we draw a border anywhere over here in this range, A gets more out of that settlement than by rejecting that settlement and fighting a war. Now we have to do the exact same thing for B. So remember over here, this was B's expected share of the territory, and B's costs of war are this size right here. Now this can be a little bit confusing because we just added CB here, but you know, costs are supposed to be negative, we're supposed to be paying costs. But if you look at this from B's perspective, B likes settlements that are as far to the left as possible. So by adding CB to this number line, we have moved the expected outcome of the war to B or for B closer to B. So that's why we added it here and not subtracted it. And after we deduct these costs of war from A's expected share of the territory, we see that B's expected war payoff is this interval right here. That's how much B expects to get from a war. And in turn, B is willing to settle anywhere over here. So any settlement over here to the left of PA plus CB gives more to B than what B would receive out of a war. And so that's why B is willing to accept these sorts of settlements. Now, if we overlap A's and B's settlements that they prefer to war, 
then you see an overlap actually. Anything in this range right here is mutually preferable to war. Both A and B prefer settlements in here than to reject that settlement and fight a war and get their war payoffs and expectation whether this is B's war's payoff or A's war payoff. And so we call this interval right here the bargaining range. These are the set of settlements that both A and B would prefer to war, and they always exist because these costs are positive. So anything in between PA and uh, PA minus CA and PA plus CB is mutually preferable to war. And so when states are bargaining over issues, we expect them to settle in this range, which is determined by three things. It's determined by the probability of victory, it's determined by the costs of one side, and it's determined by the costs of the other side. But anything in here is mutually preferable to war. Okay, so now we are done with the geometric bargaining range, and in the next video we're going to start developing a game theoretical model of this. And the reason for that is we need to start relaxing assumptions eventually, and in order to do that we need to impose a little bit more structure in the bargaining environment, and a game theoretical model is what's going to allow us to do that. So in the next video we will start constructing that game theoretical model. Join me then.